thank you very much, Veronique. Um, and uh, grazie agli organizzatori del convegno, Raffaella Marcelli e Cecilia Paolini per l'invito a questo bellissimo convegno e nella bellissima città di Roma, per non parlare del posto dove ci troviamo adesso, eh, ideale per, uh, de, per presentare un uh, paper su Rubens. Okay, presenterò uh, questo intervento in inglese um, e inizio. Although Rubens' erudition and speculative ability have been largely acknowledged by his contemporaries as well as his first biographers, only a limited number of publications on selected aspects of Rubens' mind have been published. Most of Rubens' immense literature has focused on the artist's reception of the antique and Renaissance painting on studio practices on Rubens' painting technique and on the artist as a collector. While this line of research has been and still is highly valuable for the general, general reconstruction of his oeuvre, the scant quantity of scholarly contributions on Rubens' intellectual output represents a severe lack in the artist's scholarship. Furthermore, these contributions have concentrated, concentrated on specific areas of Rubens' encyclopedic mind without harmonizing them with the rest of his thinking. They did not rely on a solid scholarly tradition since interest in this field has started only in the beginning of our century as a consequence of a renewed interest in the artist's theoretical notebook. The latter consists in a booklet in which the Flemish master master registered and developed art theoretical insights based on hermetic and esoteric traditions. Although the original manuscript has been severely damaged in a fire in 1720 in Paris, parts of Rubens' autograph ver version are likely kept in four transcripts originated during Rubens' lifetime. A comparison of the four surviving manuscripts makes it possible to get a grip on his thoughts. In it, Rubens wrote down his observation on art and nature, exploring a wide variety of interests ranging from proportions, anatomy, optics, symmetry, and the study of the human passions. The all being included within the hermetic neoplatonic framework peculiar of his time. The notebook shows how Rubens ambitiously tied theory to practice, making of it an essential document in our absolute understanding of Rubens' mind. The first question one should ask at this point is why did Rubens' scholars take so long to engage in, artist in the artist's theoretical studies? It is generally assumed that Leonardo da Vinci and Albrecht Dürer, for, for instance, provided illustrious precedents for Rubens' theoretical approach to the study of nature. Clues to Rubens' fascination with Leonardo are given by his main biographer, the French art critic Roger Depille. Depille, since 1699, in possession of Rubens' original, original notebook, quoted several passages from it wherein Rubens recorded Leonardo visual sources, including more theoretical issues. The Peel testimony clearly shows how Leonardo's notes and drawings on anatomy and physiognomy made their mark on the young Rubens. The same could be said for his stereometric study of the Farnese Hercules, wherein it is evident that Rubens was looking at Albrecht Dürer's work as well as that of other German artists. While a number of scholars has dedicated a great deal of attention to Leonardo's obsession with nature as a source of artistic and technical inspiration, this is not the case for Rubens. What is the reason of this lacuna? The answer to this question can be traced back to the late 19th century when some notable Rubens experts adopted a sceptical behavior towards his interests in physiognomy, Parcells and alchemy, 
Christian Kabbalah and Hermeticism. More specifically, the master notes on the occult were difficult to reconcile with Rubens' religious commitment with Catholic faith. Therefore, scholars like Max Roses and Ludwig Burkhardt considered the theoretical notebook to be entirely apocryphal. To them, it seemed impossible to see the Baroque genius Rubens, generally considered as the most prolific and brilliant propagandist for Catholic, Catholic Habsburg power, as a practitioner, practitioner, practitioner of foolishness. Since the early modern period, alchemists and natural magicians had been dismissed as enemies of the Christian faith and therefore persecuted, arrested, and in some cases, brutally executed. Traces of this misbelief are still persistent in the 18th century, when the French art lover Charles Antoine Chambert published a printed edition of Rubens' notebook. Chambert's book, Théorie de la figure humaine, saw the light in 1773 in Paris and was largely based on one of the four transcripts. Jambert did not translate all texts contained in the original manuscript. On the contrary, he expressly omitted illustrations and those passages which dealt with natural philosophy, alchemy, and Kabbalah. In his introduction, he explained the reasons of his decision to suppress some passages from Rubens' theoretical study. I translate from the French, I have only removed two chapters on Kabbalistic principles, one on the properties of the numbers applied to the operations of alchemy, the other on the primitive creation of the first man, who was an hermaphrodite, on the marriage of the sun with the moon, on and on other fancies, drawn from hermetic philosophy, which seemed to me useless and absurd. Jambert clearly considered those passages related to natural philosophy to be illogical and, in his words, useless and absurd. And his opinion justified this decision to omit some chapters from Rubens' writings. At this point, one could ask to which extent Jambert's ideas have had an impact on later Rubens' scholarship. We can affirm with certainty that similar ideas persisted along Rubens' experts in the, follow in the following century. These scholars were faced with a dichotomy, nam namely how to relate the established image of the Catholic Rubens with that of a painter who is also a practitioner of natural philosophy and of all sorts of di diabolic arts. They did not know that this di dichotomy was a, a characteristic feature of the European culture of the early modern period. It is absolutely not uncommon to see a Catholic as Rubens engaged in natural philosophical pursuits. There are many examples of 17th and 17th, 16th and 17th century Catholic intellectuals who practiced, practiced uh, chemical operations or lived and operated at the borders of orthodoxy. Among them, to remain close to Rubens, Rubens' most important mentors, Otto van Ven and Justus Lipsius, but also Sir Ken Kenelm Digby, who had been a close friend of Anthony van Dyck and an acquaintance of Rubens' studio. Looking back at the intellectual context of 17th century Antwerp and Italy, wherein the young Rubens has, had been trained, seemed to be a necessary corrective to a historiography that has insulated the artist's notes on the occult from his thinking. This methodological approach, which follows the rules proper to intellectual history, ser serves the main purpose to re-examine Rubens' persona as it has been shaped by its context. This methodology also allows us to understand why he addressed certain controversial themes in his notebook. After a brief account of Rubens' early ed education in Cologne and Antwerp, I will concentrate my full attention to the Italian years. 
In fact, although the period spent by the young Rubens in Antwerp has been, been pivotal to the latter's education and first contacts with subjects pertaining to natural philosophy in general, in Italy Rubens will bring the knowledge, this knowledge to full circle. Born in Siegen, nearby the city of Cologne, Rubens has received his first education from his father Jan. The account reported by Rubens' first biographer, his nephew Philip Rubens, can be acknowledged as reliable on the grounds of Jan Rubens' reputation as a scholar, who was also well-versed in Latin. After 10 years spent in Germany, Rubens' family, which was, and this is relevant to mention, of Calvinist faith, converted to Catholicism in order to return back to its native country, which they had to flee 20 years before for reasons of faith. As a boy, he had attended a renowned grammar school in Antwerp, bringing his command of Latin and his accomplishment of classical reading to new heights. Around 1595, he had entered the studio of the learned painter Otto van Venn. Rubens' training in Van Venn Atelier is relevant not only for the acquisition of the practical aspects of his professional training as an artist, but also for the more and somehow overlooked theoretical aspect. In fact, Van Venn was among the first men from Rubens' environment to act as a cult cultural mediator in the transmission of secret knowledge. During his youth in Liège at the service of Prince Bishop Ernest of Bavaria, Van Venn became acquainted with the teaching of the Swiss physician and alchemist Paracelsus, who will reform the traditional medicine in early modern Europe. The only surviving document attesting Van Venn's interest towards Paracelsianism is a booklet, the Physica et Theologica Conclusiones, published at Orcellis in 1621, for which he was charged with the heresy by the Faculty of Theology of Leuven in 1627 and 1630. The lack of textual evidence besides this publication and the fact that even Rubens expressed the desire to read this text senza parlarne con uomo vivente se così è necessario in a 1622 letter to his ma master's brother, Peter van Venn, attests to a certain secrecy among erudite circles towards the matter of occult sciences. This seems to be a widespread phenomenon which also reaches the dogmatical ambiguous uh, uh, Justus Lipsius. Together with van Venn, Lipsius, besides being the restorer of Neostoicism, was also the other influential man in Rubens' early life. The impact that Lipsus' ideas on Stoic ethics have had on Rubens' artistic production have indeed been largely acknowledged by art historical scholarship. Less known is that for this philosopher, the study of nature constituted a prerequisite for carrying out any serious investigation in the field of ethics. Lipsus addressed and developed his most interesting reflections pertaining to nature in his treatise, The Physiologia Stoicorum, published in Antwerp in 1604. This book, for its eclectic method, consisting in combining and harmonizing different ancient esoteric sources and for the themes discussed, is essential for our understanding of Rubens' theoretical output. Until, until the year of his death in 1606, um, by the time Rubens was living for six years in, on the Italian peninsula, Lipsius' authority and teachings have had a considerable impact on his pupils' mindset and education as a practical, practical man who also cherished the heritage of the ancients. During his time in Italy, the ambitious artist crossed his path with many learned friends some of them were active members of the first scientific societies devoted to the transmission of secret knowledge. Rubens' encounter with the Italian academies were anti-Aristotelianism, empiricism, and intellectual freedom dominated the scene 
and was made possible by means of political protection and ecclesiastical patronage, provided the young painter a fertile ground for developing, developing the ideas in his notebook. Rubens was among the fortunate northern artists to undertake the Italian journey in order to complete his humanist education. Part of his early success was favored by the so social position occupied by some members of his family. Rubens' older brother, Philip, for instance, was appointed secretary to Cardinal Ascanio Colonna in Rome after completing his studies with Lipsius in Leuven. The Flemish philosopher used to supply his most promising pu pupils with le letters of recommendation in order to favor their appointment with, within the social-political social system of Italian court, courts. At the beginning of the 17th century, there were a considerable number of Lipsius pupils in Venice, Padua, and Rome who followed Neo-Stoicism, influencing the ideas of prominent Italian intellectuals. Many of them were converts and for this reason more suitable to satisfy the strategy of polemical patronage adopted by powerful Catholic cardinals. The northern-born Rubens brothers were both Lipsius students, and I will remind that Lipsius himself converted to Catholicism and came from a family of Catholic converts. Their presence on the Italian peninsula should also be related to Lipsius, um, to Lipsius' agenda of promoting Stoicism by Christianizing ancient pagan philosophers. Before Lipsius' interventions, Stoic doctrine was regarded as incompatible with Christianity, and some of his works had even undergone rigorous investigation by the censors. After his conversion, Lipsius' desire was to ensure that his work was in conformity with the Catholic faith and, and it would be acknowledged as such by the Inquisition. Among his favorite pupils, the Rubens brothers, carried out the task of rehabilitating Lipsius' image as a Catholic scholar. In this light, we should also understand the significant gesture of Philip Rubens delivering Lipsius' edition of Seneca to Pope Paul, Paul V in, in 1605, or the scholar's engagement in antiquarian studies. In fact, the attitude towards the classics shared by Peter Paul was another manifestation of Lipsius' larger program of blending ancient philosopher, philosophies with Christianity. On the other side, the Lipsius message reached also the promoters of the newly born scientific academies. For instance, Federico Cesi, the nephew of Cardinal Bartolome Bartolomeo Cesi and founder of the Accademia dei Lincei, wrote that he had studied Lipsian neostoicism and that he possessed some of the philosopher's works in his library. The same can be said for Johann Faber, the German physician and beloved friend of Rubens, who became a member of the Roman Academia in 1611 and held a strong position inside the Curia. During his three years in Rome, Rubens, Rubens actively participated to the artistic cultural activities promoted by the members of the Lincean Academy. Between the end of 1605 and spring of 1607, in particular, the artist then living with his brother Philip in the Rione Campo Marzio became acquainted with Cardinal, Barto Cardinal Bartolomeo Cesi. The Rubens brothers regularly visited uh, Cesi household as confirmed by copies made by Peter Paul after ancient statues in the gardens of the Roman ca cardinal, including the boy with the goose and the so-called Cesi Leda. In the household of Cardinal Cesi, the Rubens brothers met Antonio Persio, a natural philosopher and follower of Bernardino Telesio, whose work had been severely condemned by the Roman Inquisition 
for its critique towards Aristotelianism and for its dangerous assertion on the nature of the human soul. A priest from Materia, Matera, Persia, is renowned for having edited Telesio works and disseminating his ideas. In, in 1570s, he also entered into a close friendship with Francisco Patrizzi, who had been responsible for the revival of Hermetic and Platonic philosophy at the end of the 16th century in Rome, and with the Calabrian friar Tommaso Campanella. Philip Rubens wrote a poem to Antonio Persio, which celebrates the latter's treatise Del Bever Caldo, published in 1593 in Venice. In this work, Persio aimed to establish whether the ancient Romans used to mix wine with hot or cold water, a relevant topic in the field of medicine. In fact, supporting the idea of the ancient use of hot water meant for Persio to support the Telesian principle of spiritus, a vital heat of which man is endowed and which needs to assume elements with similar hot qualities in order to secure man's preservation. Persia discourse has to be placed in a broader cultural context of opposition towards the more traditional medical approaches. Those ideas were applauded by Lipsius in a letter written to Persia in 1603. The Flemish philosopher was known to Persia already 10 years before. In his proemio to Del Bever Caldo, Telesio follower mentions to having read a certain Osservazione del Bever Caldo, degli antichi fatta da un fiammingo uomo della nostra, dell'età nostra, molto dotto delle cose antiche. In this circumstance, Persio is certainly referring to Lipsius, who in his edited volume Tacitus Annals had stated that the ancient Romans used to drink hot water. More importantly, Lipsius will develop similar theories concerning the notion of spiritus in his Physiologia Stoicorum in about the same years. Similarly to Telesio and his faithful disciple, Persio, Rubens' master had maintained the existence of a universal and sympathetic spiritus inhabiting all living creatures, men and animals. Contrary to Telesius' teachings, Lipsius had proud, uh, prudently rejected the corporeal nature of the principle for its, its incompatibility with Christian doctrine. At this point, it seems appropriate to mention Rubens' physiognomical studies in which the artist developed comparative analysis between humans and certain animals, such as the lion, the bull, and the horse. Irene Baldriga had already noted the parallels between Rubens' drawings and the interest in comparative physiognomy held by the, his German friend Faber and the Lincean Circle in Rome. Well documented is also its close relationship with the treatise De Humana Physiognomonia by Giovanni Battista della Porta, who will join the Roman Academy in 1610. I propose that Rubens' theoretical investigations reflect certain discussions pertaining to the nature of the human soul or the notion of spiritus, which were developed by a group of scholars in opposition to the established Aristotelian tradition advocated by the church. Another case of dissent towards the canonical authorities concerns the matter of Paracelsianism, a theme which Rubens also addressed in his notebook. The interest of the members of the Lincean Academy towards the spagyric art uh, had been studied in depth in the last decades, and it seems thus logical to link Rubens notes on alchemy with the experiments carried out by the Lynchians. Books and manuscripts by the Swiss alchemists are connected to his teachings, circulated in Chase's circle since its early years. Rubens would have become acquainted with his knowledge through Faber, who was a physician himself 
and was strongly interested in the writings, writings of the eccentric alchemist. Faber possessed the entire work of Paracelsus, as well as the works of Northern pa Protestant and Catholic followers. For its controversial, ca controversial character and heterodox reputation, Paracelsus' work had been included in several indices of forbidden books. In 1616, the Cong Congregation for the Index asked the German-speaking Faber to investigate Paracelsus' work. In these circumstances, which I have briefly sketched, it is not surprising to see Faber expressing a moderate judgment with respect to the work of Paracelsus. It has been long demonstrated that Paracelsianism denied the Aristotelian distinction between the terrestrial and celestial realms and supported the recent astronomical and cosmological discoveries. The Paracelsian idea of material unity in the natural world was highly complementary to Lipsius' views on the existence of a universal spiritus filling the whole universe. This should not surprise us since Lipsius had been involved with Paracelsianism during his youth at the servi service of Cardinal Granvel. Anyway, at the beginning of the 17th century, the Lincean Circle of Rome established contacts with the most illustrious scholars in order to acquire alchemical books and satisfy their search for the secrets of nature. For instance, the exchange, exchanges between Cesi Academy and Don Antonio de' Medici in Florence are well documented. Don Antonio, the adopted son of Francesco I de' Medici, was also a great experimenter and patron of alchemists. He set up an alchemical laboratory at the Casino di San Marco and compiled a number of alchemical recipes in a book containing Tutta l'arte spagirica di Tovrasto Paracelso, published in 1604. Besides being one of the most accomplished Paracelsian devotees, Don Antonio was the half-brother of Maria de' Medici, the future Queen of France. We know that Rubens attended the Grand Ducal wedding of Maria de' Medici and Henry IV of France, who took place in Florence in 1600 as a member of the retinue of the Duke of Mantua. More than 20 years later, Rubens was commissioned the famous cycle of paintings de dedicated to the life of the Queen, destined to decorate the Luxembourg Palace in Paris. Among the 24 pictures of the old cycle, the arrival of Maria de' Medici in Marseille in par is particularly significant in this case. In fact, on this occasion, Maria de' Medici, half-brother Don Antonio, under the leading of five Maltese galleys, accompanied his sister with his retinue from Livorno to Marseille. Mm. I forgot that one. It has been recently proposed to identify the figure of the Knight of Malta standing in the foreground, in the foreground with Don Giovanni de' Medici, who at the time was in charge of the Royal, royal Galley. This identification sh should be revised, since Don Antonio and not Don Giovanni belong to the order. Don Antonio had been, forced, had been forced by his uncle, the Grand Duke Ferdinando, to join the Order of the Knights of Malta at a young age, already in 1594. He's usually portrayed wearing a black suit with the cross of the Order. Probably on the request of the Queen Mother and to commemorate his brother, who had died a year before Rubens had signed the contract for the Medici cycle in 1622, Rubens portrayed the effigy of Don Antonio de' Medici in the man standing on the galley, looking at the Queen during the tri her tri triumphant arrival at Marseille. It is a fascinating suggestion that Rubens might have painted Don Antonio, a man who at the time was chiefly celebrated for his chemical skills and for having set up an important alchemical laboratory in Florence. 
Antonio's Fonderia, beautiful, beautifully illustrated by Filippo Napoletano in 1619, had reached notoriety north of the Alps. For instance, in Antwerp, the wealthy Portuguese mer merchant Emmanuel Ximenes, who was a lover of the alchemical arts and one of Rubens' clients, exchanged his se secrets with some of Antonio's chemists working at the Casino di San Marco. These few examples which I have discussed today partially illustrate the extent to which Rubens participated in an endeavor where physiognomy, alchemy, and other arts related to those fields were highly valued and even promoted by the scientific patronage of princely and ecclesiastical courts. As a young man, Rubens was fully immersed in this peculiar body of knowledge, and thus it should not surprise us to see him noting down in his notebook everything which his curious eyes might have exper experienced. The notebook represents a visual testimony of a larger cultural program which promoted the role of occult sciences uh, disciplines in the development of natural sciences, endorsed by many of his age, but specifically by his mentor, the great philosopher Justus Lipsius. Thank you very much.